Welcome to the first ever Long Island Coastal BioBlitz training webinar. We are so excited to have you all joining us tonight. My name is Ariel Santos. I am the policy program coordinator for CTUF, and I will be moderating today's webinar. So the goal for today's presentation is to, of course, share this exciting event with you all, but it will also act as a training workshop to explain what a BioBlitz is, how to join the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz specifically, and what's involved in participating in an event such as this. So I just wanted to go over some housekeeping notes first before we begin. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on CTUC's website shortly after the webinar concludes. Your video and microphones are turned off, but you are free to ask questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. If you don't have a question but want to share a resource or discuss amongst the group, you're more than welcome to use the chat box. So with that, we can hop right into the presentation. So the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz was created in partnership between SeaTuck Environmental Association, Long Island Sound Study, New York Sea Grant, Peconic Estuary Partnership, South Shore Estuary Reserve, and the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. SeaTuck is a 501c3 organization dedicated to conserving Long Island wildlife and the environment. The Long Island Sound Study is a bi-state partnership consisting of federal and state agencies, user groups, concerned organizations, and individuals dedicated to restoring and protecting the sound. New York Sea Grant represents a statewide network of integrated research, education, and extension services promoting coastal community economic vitality environmental sustainability and citizen awareness and understanding about the state's marine and Great Lakes resources. The Peconic Estuary Partnership is a national estuary program that works to protect and restore the Peconic Estuary. PEP staff and partners support monitoring, research, collaboration, and education to address priority issues within the Peconic Estuary and its watershed. The South Shore Estuary Reserve Program guides the preservation, protection, enhancement of the natural, recreational, economic, and educational resources of the estuary through partnerships with a diverse group of stakeholders, including state, federal, and local organizations. And lastly, we have the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area, which is a voluntary partnership of many organizations from the geographic area that includes Staten Island, Long Island and 11 additional coastal plain, pond, plain islands. They are one of eight prisms or partnership for regional invasive species management that cover all of New York state. So I know that was a lot of information. So I will be sure to include each of their websites in the chat box in a moment, just in case you'd like to learn more about the awesome work that they do. So to kick things off, we thought it would be great to have a nice poll here which asks you, have you heard of a BioBlitz before? So I'm gonna launch that poll now. And we'll give you about a minute or two to answer. Just so you know, all answers are automatically submitted anonymously. So if you haven't heard of a BioBlitz before, don't worry about it. I'm sure you're not the only one, but that's why we're all here today anyway, right? So. All right, so it looks like most people have heard of a BioBlitz before, that's great. Awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll here. All right. Now, I think a good place to start would be defining what a BioBlitz is. I know half of you at least know what it is, but it's defined as a community science effort to record as many species as possible within a designated location and time period. So a BioBlitz is a great way to get outside and learn more about the environment you live in. You typically participate with a large group of people, which can be a lot of fun. You can see what other participants are finding in their neighborhood and they can see what you found. And since the BioBlitz is designed to focus on a specific geographic area and time period, it kind of acts as a snapshot of the biodiversity, which is really cool. And some other great aspects of a BioBlitz are that you can discover rare or endangered species. You can help identify invasive species, preserve unique and valuable habitats, understand long-term changes, 
and like I touched on before, build community connections with nature and better understand the biodiversity of your area. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Emily Hall. She's the conservation policy advocate also of CTUC, and she will talk about all the different habitats included in this coastal bioblitz and the various species you might find there. Thanks, Ariel. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Ariel mentioned, I'm going to be going over some of the really unique and valuable habitats that we have on Long Island. Um, some of the species you might see while you're kind of bioblitzing in these habitats. And then some of the specific sites, kind of parks and preserves um, that you can go to to see some of these species and habitats. So the first one we'll start with is beaches and dunes. Obviously, Long Island is well known for its beautiful beaches and kind of diverse variety of beach habitats. So beaches and dunes are kind of defined as transitional sandy or cobble shoreline area between the land and marine environment. These dynamic systems are in a constant state of erosion and deposition due to tidal action, currents, and wind. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned, we'll go over some of the species you may see in the in these habitats. This definitely is an exhaust isn't an exhaustive list, but it's kind of just a small portion of some of the ones you might encounter. I should also point out that we've identified some species that are native and some species that are invasive. Native species means that it's a species that's developed as part of the ecosystem over time for basically hundreds or thousands of years. It's kind of developed into an ecosystem and provides fu specific functions to an ecosystem. Invasive means that it's non-native and it uh, produces some kind of harm to the economy, environment, or human health. I should also make a note though, that there are some plants or animals that are non-native, but not necessarily invasive because either they don't establish as well or they don't cause harm associated, um, that's associated with invasives. Also, each species is often found in more than one of these habitats. So we're just kind of creating a little bit of a, um, just, I should say highlight, highlight a species you might see. All right, so let's start with horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs are very characteristic species of our beaches. They've been around for more than 300 million years and are more closely related to spiders than crabs. During the late spring and early summer, these crabs travel from the deep ocean waters to our coast to breed and their eggs are a food source for coastal birds. Next, another great species is the American oyster catcher. This shorebird is boldly patterned with red yellow eyes, a red orange bill, a black head and breast, brown wings and a white underbelly. They are some of the only birds in this environment that are able to open clams in oysters, hence their name. So the common tern, they are the most widespread tern in North America. They have long, narrow and angular wings with pointed wing tips. Unlike gulls, they have straight and slender bills. Their tail is also forked. Their bills also have an orange color with them tipped in black, while they have a black cap for the breeding birds. And then for the non-breeding birds, you might see a white forehead. They also forage in groups and then nest on the ground in colonies. All right, the amazing seaside goldenrod. And this is a native perennial plant that produces a tight clump or narrow evergreen leaves with deep yellow flowering heads and it's highly salt tolerant and deer resistant. The tree of heaven. So this is the first invasive that we're looking at tonight. This plant was native to China. It was introduced to the US in the 1700s as an ornamental plant. The bark is smooth and brownish green when young and eventually turns light brown to gray, resembling the skin of a cantaloupe. It's capable of reaching 80 feet in height and the flowers are small yellow green and appearing clusters. All right, next slide. So then also we'll be highlighting some of the bio blitz sites that you can go to that you can see some of these habitats. And again, a lot of the sites consist of multiple different habitats, but we're just kind of highlighting a few for you. Also, I should point out that each habitat or each site is labeled um, with a different estuary that's associated with it. So SSER stands for the South Shore Estuary Reserve, LISS stands for the Long Island Sound Study, and PEP stands for the Peconic Estuary Partnership. So these are the three regions where you can find some of these different parks and preserves. So where you can find beaches, some of them are include Robert Moses, Wellwind Preserve County Park, Northwest Harbor County Park, West Meadow Beach, and Jones Beach State Park. All right, next slide. 
All right, so moving on to amazing salt marshes. Salt marshes are coastal wetlands that are flooded and drained by salt water brought in by tides. The soil of a salt marsh is composed of deep mud and peat, which is decomposing plant matter. Uh, salt marshes also serve as, oh, I'll just go back one second. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to mention also that they serve as amazing nursery habitat and they also protect the coast from erosion by creating kind of a buffer against these power and powerful waves that can come with storms. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so one of the biggest kind of invasives you might see in this area and you're probably probably familiar with is the common reed. You may have also heard this referred to as Phragmites or Frag. It's a very aggressive perennial plant that outcompetes native plants and displaces native animals. It can reach 15 feet in height and is often found in dense stands. The leaves are blue green to yellow green and in late July to August they have purple to gold highly branched flowers. The seeds will appear grayish to fluffy later in the season. Next, we have the very, very neat diamondback terrapin. It's the only turtle that inhabits coastal marshes with brackish water. Brackish water is a mix of salt and fresh water. The carapace of this turtle or shell has multiple diamond shaped rings and their skin can range in color from dark gray to white with black irregular spots. And although their primary habitat is in the marsh, they can also be found um, right now during this season actually nesting on some sandy areas and beaches close to the marsh. After that, we have fiddler crabs. The males have one claw that's much larger than the other. Some think resembling a fiddle, hence their name. Both males and females have a smooth shell and square shaped body. Each animal has its own burrow with a small area of sand and mud around it. The, uh, the burrow is a refuge during high tide and an escape from predators. All right, perennial pepperweed, another one of our invasives. It's a weed introduced from southeastern Europe and Asia. It grows approximately one to three feet tall. It has milky white flowers that form dense round clusters with bright green to gray green leaves. They can rapidly form large dense stands that displace other vegetation. And then lastly for our marshes, the rib mussel. It's yellow to yellow brown to brownish black on the top side of the shell with the glossy underside. The shell is shaped like a long rounded tri triangle with ridges on it. They burrow partially in the mud and remain partially exposed. And this is so that they can filter feed, which contribute to both water quality and salt marsh growth. All right, next slide. Some of the awesome sites on the island that you can see salt marshes include Aquabana Harbor, Marine Nature Study Area, Sunken Meadow State Park, Indian Island County Park, and the JFK Wildlife Sanctuary. Next slide. All right, so let's go over um, a bit about the freshwater wetlands, streams, and ponds. So freshwater wetlands, streams, and ponds are often habitats that can be found together or in close proximity. Freshwater wetlands are the transitional zone between the land and fresh water. These are areas where the water table is at or near the surface of the soil and there is no tidal influence. Many Long Island streams or ponds are also fed by groundwater. However, our coastal streams may be influenced by tidal cycles and sometimes get some salt and kind of uh, where they meet the bay. So what are the species you might see here? Um, many of you probably know bullfrogs and can probably hear them um, during this current season. So bullfrogs are the largest frogs in North America. They are green with some mottled darker green, black and brown patterning. They also have a circle shaped external organ, which is their eardrum. You can see it in that picture there, right behind the eyes. And they make a loud distinctive juggerum sound um, when they're currently calling out to their mates. Uh, the great blue heron, they are the largest of the North American herons. They have long legs and a thick dagger-like bill. They appear blue-gray with a wide black stripe over their eye. And then Japanese knotweed, another very troublesome invasive, was introduced into the U.S. from Eastern Asia as an ornamental in the late 1800s. It's a shrubby, herbaceous, wood-appearing perennial that can reach 10 to 15 feet high. They also have branch-like offshoots of small greenish-white flowers from August to September. Next, we have the spotted salamander, a visually eye-catching salamander with bluish black or darker brown coloring and two rows of yellow or orange spots. They are an iconic vernal pool species, meaning that they were reliant on vernal pools, which are temporary seasonal bodies of water to breed. Then we have the spotted turtle. This polka dot turtle has yellow spots on its head, neck, 
legs are an upper shell with a black background coloration. They are active from March to October and may be seen alone or in groups. Next slide, thank you. So some sites on Long Island where you can see some of this freshwater habitat include Cranberry Bog Preserve, South Shore Nature Center, Connectquat River State Park, Emma Rose Elliston Memorial Park, and Halleck State Park Preserve. All right, next we have coastal grasslands. Coastal grasslands are open glacial outwash plains dominated by tall grasses such as little blue stem and switchgrass. They often have a diverse wildflower community as well. Next slide. All right, some of the species you may see here include the black-eyed Susan, which is native to North America and is a very popular wildflower. It attracts butterflies, beads, and a variety of insects for pollination. Plants bloom from June to October and they have brightly colored flowers with shades of lemon, yellow, orange, and gold. The black locusts. Um, and it's an, again an invasive. Um, while this plant is actually native to some parts of the country, it is invasive to others. It was planted outside of its native range for hardwood lumber, erosion control, and nectar for honey. Through May and June, it produces drooping clusters of fragrant white flowers. Next, we have another invasive mile a minute. It's a vine that smothers other plants by growing over them. It can grow up to six inches per day. It's native to India and Eastern Asia and was accidentally introduced via a contaminated seed. It has a unique leaf shape with barbs on the stem and the underside of the leaf. Small white flowers appear in early summer and spikes of pea-sized blue fruit appear in July. Then we have mugwort, another invasive. It's native to Europe and Eastern Asia where it, use, it used to be um, used as a medicinal herb. Shoots emerge, emerge during the spring and flowers uh, occur July to late September. Adult stems are long with numerous branches towards the upper part of the plant. Then we have the New England aster. This is a really beautiful native. It has colorful flowers with deep violet to lavender pink coloring. They can grow up to six feet high and provide a critical source for, of fall nectar for pollinators, especially in monarchs as they stock up for their fall migration. All right, so um, Kemset State Park um, is one of, the, one of the only parks that kind of has um, a good amount of accessible grasslands that we have on our list. However, a lot of the species I just mentioned can often be found kind of in your neighborhood or maybe even in your front or backyard. So definitely keep an eye on them even locally as you're kind of observing for the bio blitz. Next slide. Coastal and inland forests. So coastal and inland forests around Long Island are heavily influenced by the coastal climate of Long Island. They also can have structural complexity with multiple vegetation layers. Next slide. Some of the species you may see include the bald eagle. Over the last several years, bald eagles had successfully returned to Long Island to breed. Obviously, they have their characteristic white heads with dark brown bodies. They eat mostly fish, which is one of the reasons you can find them near lakes, reservoirs, rivers, marshes, and coves. Again, the black um, locust is also uh, prevalent as an invasive in forests as well as grasslands, so keep an eye out for that. Then we have garlic mustard, another invasive. It's originally from Europe and Asia and has become a very troublesome invasive. It's introduced to North America in the mid 1800s for herbal and medicinal qualities, but it blocks out native plant sunlight and outcompetes them for moisture. So in their first year, the leaves are rounder and take on a roseate formation. And then their second year, they grow up a stem and become more tri triangular and heart-shaped with tooth edges. Small white, four petaled flowers emerge in the spring. Multiflora rosa, a uh, multiflora rose. It's an invasive native to China, Japan, and Korea. It was introduced in the late 1800s and used in horticulture. It is a climbing shrub with white flowers that appear from May through June and are grouped or clustered. And then lastly, we have Norway maple, a large deciduous tree that can grow approximately 40 to 60 feet in height. They are usually broader than they are high and it forms a broad rounded crown. They also produce helicopter-like seeds in the summer and in the fall, they turn a pale yellow. They were introduced um, also from Europe as a horticulture species. Next slide. And then some of the sites you can see coastal and inland forests include Wertheim National Wildlife Refuge, Heckscher State Park, Alley Pond Park, Ashmomick Preserve, and um, Mush um, sorry, <laughs> I always have a hard time, um, Mishomick Preserve as well. 
All right, and then at this point, we're gonna go and have another quick poll of how familiar you are with the iNaturalist platform. So this is the platform where you're going to have participants use to observe all these different species for the BioBlitz. All right, so it looks like we have a bit of a mix. Some people are not familiar, some people are very, and a bit of people are kind of in between. So I'm now going to hand it over to our great partners at LISMA um, to go over the iNaturalist platform and give you some BioBlitz kind of tips and tricks. Thanks so much, Emily. Thanks for doing that great presentation on all the species and ecosystems we can be excited about seeing. Um, I'm Abby. I'm from LISMA, the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. Um, and I'm here uh, joined by Haley Gladich and Bill Jacobs. Um, uh, just to quickly say, LISMA is a voluntary association of land managers and landowners working together to prevent the spread of invasive species. But in this bio blitz, you don't need to just look for invasive species. You can look for whatever you want. But if you find some invaders, we'd be very interested to know. Um, next slide. So you've heard of all these great species and ecosystems that Long Island has to offer. Um, but what are you supposed to do about it? So in this bio blitz, you get the chance to explore these areas and log any species that you discover in the app um, or, or website iNaturalist. And it's great to see that there are some, uh, we can introduce some new people to iNaturalist too. I love iNaturalist and I talk about it all day. <laughs> um, everybody participating in this bio blitz can get to see the things you find and help you identify species and even cheer you on. On iNaturalist, there have been over 67 million observations, um, just like total across the whole platform. And anyone can do this. You don't need to be an expert in plant or animal ID or memorize this whole presentation in order to be involved. We actually know of one 14 year old on Long Island that has logged over 19,000 observations. And a few of those have been invasive species that helped us uh, learn about what's out there. So it's proof that community science really helps. And next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what iNaturalist is, how you can sign up and how it works for this BioBlitz. And now I'll pass it off to Bill. Thank you, Abby. I'm going to share my screen, my phone screen. There are two ways to get into iNaturalist. One is to go to the website at inaturalist.org. And when you go to the website for the first time, you can register. All you need is your email address and choose a password. They'll ask you to confirm your email address. And then uh, you'll be able to use the online version, the desktop version. There's also a phone version, a phone app of iNaturalist. Similar to uh, the desktop version, you use your app store, whichever, whether you have an iPhone or an Android, whatever your app store is, go to go search for iNaturalist. It's a free app, download it onto your phone. And you can also register there with your email address and a password. I'm going to show you how easy it is. So you can see I have iNaturalist right there. Click it. And iNaturalist, both on the phone and on the uh, website, keep track of every species that you identify. It's very cool. You can keep a life list of plants, animals, just about anything you see out there. And all you have to do is take a picture of it. It's an amazing app. For example, I've taken pictures recently of, I've got some unknowns. And if you don't know what the species is, iNaturalist will help you identify it. It has uh, artificial intel intelligence that can help you identify it. It also has a community of people who go through the, the uh, records and help folks identify whatever they've seen. So this is a dogwood that I saw 
This one is actually not finished. It's probably a test because it's the genus, but not the species. Here's a, let's see, let's find another one. This is a good one. So this is a white heath aster. I wasn't sure what it was, but through the iNaturalist app, it helped me to identify it. So in West Sayville. So this keeps track of all your observations. And I've had, I have 351 species that I've observed. So what I'm going to do is show you how to make a new entry. I go to observations, this green circle with the plus sign in it on the lower right hand corner. Just hit that whenever you're going to take a picture of a plant or animal. I have some plants right here with me. So I'm going to select take photo and see if I naturalist works. All right, and then try to get a clear photo if you can with uh, some identifying feature. In this case, I have a flower, which is fortunate if you have flowers, but it will do it from leaves too. So I just take a picture. If I like the photo, I can hit OK. If I don't like the photo, I can hit Cancel and try again. But this time I'll say OK. And the photo went into the app. I can take another photo if I want by just clicking this little camera here on the top left. Say I want to take two or three pictures of something just to keep them. I can take another photo at a different angle. Hit OK. Now I have two photos. Also here, you can take notes. If you were at such and such a park, say I was at Connectquad State Park, I could write that in the notes. You can see, okay, whoops. All right, jump, jumped ahead on me a little bit here. Let's go back to this unknown species. All right, it, it jumped ahead a little bit on me. That was my fault. Let me take another picture. And uh, we'll just show you how easily it works. So take a photo. Let's go through this again. Just take the photo. Hit OK. You can choose whether it's captive or cultivated. Again, you can take notes. So here, this is a key part. What did you see? If you know what you saw, you can type it in. If you don't know, just hit, what did you see? And the app will find it for you. So all those plants and animals that Emily went over, if you don't remember how to identify them all, iNaturalist will identify them for you. This gave me the genus and it gave me 10 choices. And I think the peace lily, it's visually similar. Sometimes they'll also say if it's been seen nearby, I'm going to select it I'm going to Click the check mark. And that's it, as simple as that. You take a photo, hit, uh, what, what do I see? So, oh, the similar wording to that. And it will identify it for you and put it on the app. And that's all there is to it. I can show you if I have a moment, do I have a moment? I'll just show you the The desktop app. Could you also show us how to uh, join the project, Bill? Yes. Yep. Let me stop sharing. Stop share. Start here. All right. So now, can you see my screen? I'm on the internet on the website inaturalist.org sign in if you don't have an account this is where you sign up but let's sign in 
or log in. This is me, this is my profile. These are all my observations and where I saw them. Sometimes, it, yep, 352 speaker, species. To join the project, you would go up here and search for LI Coastal Bio Blitz. So in addition to just working on your own and taking pictures of plants and animals, you can also join projects. In this way, whatever you record, it will go into your personal database, but it will also go into the project. So in our case, we have the Long Island Coastal Bio Blitz right up here, and you hit About. And there it is. And just hit up here where I'm, I've already joined it. So it says leave here for me, but it will say join. So that's pretty much it. Log into iNaturalist, search for a Long Island Coastal Bio Blitz, but it, it's a LI Coastal Bio Blitz when you search, I believe. And hit join. And if you have any questions or if you forget how to do it, I'm sure there'll be email addresses at the end and you can email myself or anybody, any one of the presenters and we'll get you on. And I think that's it. iNaturalist.org, join the project LI Coastal Bio Blitz and you'll be good to go. Great, thank you. Bill, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I can share mine again, and then we can go back into the presentation. Awesome, thank you. All right. All right. That was a great presentation, Bill. Thanks so much for sharing with us how to use iNaturalist. You can go ahead a few slides we covered how to use it on the website and the phone now. Awesome. Oh, are we gonna show the videos? Sure. Sure. <laughs> as long as sound is on and the share, audio on. I think it loaded the YouTube video outside of the PowerPoint. It might not work unless we go right to YouTube, which I can do. I'm going to do it right from the Google Chrome here. Should I mute it or keep the volume on? Volume on, I think. OK, lower it a little bit. Apologies for the ad. How's that? Good. I don't think there's audio for that video. Maybe we should skip the next video. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to pull up the presentation again.
Can you guys see that okay? Yep. All right, well, awesome. Now that you guys know how to use iNaturalist, you're almost just about ready to get out into the field and start using it. So remember, you can go onto the website when either, whether you're good at multitasking and you can do it now, or when the presentation's all over, you can remember to go to the LI Coastal BioBlitz and hit join. Um, so yeah, you can head over to the next slide. So now when you are using iNaturalist, even though the algorithm is pretty good, it's gotten really good actually in the last couple of years, but it's still not <laughs> superhuman, it's not perfect. Um, and it still largely uh, relies on actual people to do some identifying. So if you do get out there and take some photos, if you follow some just like tips and tricks for taking pictures, it'll actually make you know the data a whole lot better for us. Um, so, you know, we can't get out there and see the picture ourselves, but you know, you have the power to make some awesome notes, take some great photos. Um, and I know it's pretty hard to do this sometimes. Sometimes you just take a quick snap, um, but I, cause I know I do it all the time. I take some pretty bad photos. You can go and see my own iNaturalist submissions, but you know, what, how about this summer together? We take some really great iNaturalist photos and improve on them. So you can see all of these are pretty rough. A lot of these were pulled from actual iNaturalist and for various reasons, they're pretty hard to identify. You can even tell like that first one, I don't even know what it is. And then um, for a handful of them, it's hard to scale it. How big it is is pretty unclear if it's a part of, you know, the bottom of the plant, the top of the plant. I don't know where it starts and ends. Some of them, I don't know what the organism in question really is because there's other plants that are kind of around it. Um, and a few other reasons that we'll get into in the next slide. So some photos that are really fit for a positive ID. Um, something you can do to help, you can use a solid colored background, like a shirt, maybe you have like a takeout container or just a bucket with you. Um, something solid colored to really isolate that organism in question can be really helpful. Um, another way you can isolate that mystery species is if you take your hand or a finger, maybe even coin or some keys, that'll be used as like a reference object so we can get a scale of it. Um, taking multiple photos also really helps too. And you can get some different angles as Bill did with his peace lily. You can get closer up on the organism so we can really help distinguish it. And oftentimes it can be helpful to see some other organisms because sometimes other organisms um, ob obligately associate with certain species. So seeing those other organisms can be helpful if there are also close-ups of the one organism you're looking at and trying to figure out. Um, for instance, um, if we're looking at mushrooms, again, this person, they use some awesome angles. We got the underside, which is really great for identifying. We now know that it has gills that puts us one step closer to a positive ID. Um, they also took lots of great photos. Um, I grabbed this from my naturalist, obviously. And they made a great note, really quick, simple note saying, lots of this growing attached to litter and soil, mixed hardwood and crab apple, which um, again, oftentimes mushrooms obligately grow with certain tree species which helps us to identify a picture. If we're talking about coastal areas, we can extrapolate this to maybe if somebody posted a snail and then they left a quick comment that said, lots of these snails um, all over the grasses in a salt and a low tidal marsh area. And now I can say, okay, well, I know periwinkle snails, they feed on um, salt marsh cord grass. It could be a periwinkle and put me that much closer to identifying it. Um, so again, a quick, simple note can be really helpful. Um, for plants that are submerged in, or, or for, for aquatic plants, it can be helpful to submerge them in some shallow water. If you've never taken um, seaweed or an aquatic plant out of the water, it very quickly loses its shape and just looks like a pile of mush. Um, so if you kind of submerge it in some shallow water with some good lighting, you can actually get a really great photo of an aquatic plant and we can get a really great ID. Um, for things like hermit crabs, if you feel comfortable picking it up, um, otherwise, you know, you leave it alone. But if it is submerged in the water, it might actually come out. Some hermit crabs, oh, well, hermit crabs in general, as a lot of you might know, they don't create their own shells. So being able to see the actual hermit crab itself um, can really help for identification purposes as well. But in general, you know, making sure the, um, or the organism in question is clear, you're getting a lot of those plant parts like flowers, petals, um, that can really help. So yeah, next slide. And while you're out there, we really want you to have some best practices in mind. And to keep it really simple, we want you guys to be safe, be respectful, and have fun. So while you're out there, remember to pack some essentials. It might be hot, 
it, there's going to be bugs and we really want you guys to be safe while you're out there. So remember to bring some sunscreen, pack some water and protect yourself against bugs. If we're on Long Island, we know about ticks and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So, you know, just come prepared. Think about, you know, you might be out there for a little while collecting these species. Um, so we don't want you guys wilting out there in the heat or getting eaten alive by bugs. Um, with that, we want you guys to protect yourselves from poison ivy. So by knowing what this is, you can protect yourself that much more from it. Um, and oftentimes you might see it on the ground as like just some small individuals. And you'll notice right away those three leaves that are all pretty much upright facing. Um, they're a little shiny and the leaves are irregularly lobed. Um, often those two bottom leaves are gonna be in line with each other and they're gonna be perpendicular to that top leaf in sort of like an isosceles triangle fashion. Um, you might also see them vining up a tree and that vine might look rather furry. Um, you might also see it as a woody shrub. I've seen them at about eye level and I'm about 5'1". You can't really tell right now, but that's pretty tall <laughs> for, uh, for poison ivy if you've never seen it that tall. Um, but if you know what the leaves look like, you can really easily recognize it in all forms. And if you're not sure, iNaturalist should be able to tell you what it is so you can get very familiar with it and also count it as another species that you ID'd. Um, if you do get any poison ivy on you, be sure to wash your hands off or body parts off with cold water and dish soap or Technu, which is a brand name for poison ivy specific soap. And of course we have ticks. So depending on where you are, you might easily find them in your backyard already and you might be quite familiar with them. There are three main kinds on Long Island. We have the deer tick, the dog tick, and the lone star tick. All of them are known for carrying diseases and they can all be quite small as you can see in this photo up to from even A and B, C, those are small, but you know, all the way over to D, that one's really tiny. So it's really important to protect yourself and then check yourself later on, um, especially if you're going into forested or grassy areas. But as you know, on Long Island, you can find them literally anywhere. I found them in the craziest places. Um, so before you go in there, um, you might look a little silly, but you know, if you can tuck your pants into your socks, that's great. I mean, think of it as the explorer's uniform. That's what I do when I'm walking around in my, my socks tucked into pants look. Um, and if you're so inclined, you can buy tick spray with permethrin in it to spray on your clothes and shoes, maybe your backpack, 24 hours before you go out, never on your skin. Um, and after your bio blitzing, you can, before you leave your location, be sure to do a quick tick check, feeling for warm spots behind the back of your legs, your waistline, your armpits behind your ears. Um, and a pro tip, something I always do is bring a lint roller with me and roll your clothes off. You know, you might not see these tiny little ticks, you might not feel them, but the lint roller is sticky and it'll get to them. I'll go through it like two times if I can. And then when you get home, you know, do it, take a nice hot shower, throw your clothes in the dryer because ticks really don't like the heat. Next, we want you guys to be respectful. So be respectful of park signs and private property, abide by those park rules like closing times and staying on the trails. Also, we really don't want you to trespass for the sake of the bio plates. It's not that, <laughs> don't go that deep. Um, there are plenty of cool things to see on public land or on property where you have the permission to be. Yeah, and of course, be respectful of nature. Pulling up plants in these coastal areas especially can be harmful to things like dune stability or just the populations of the plants that are there that might be rare and endangered. Um, walking on the dunes themselves too can be harmful as uh, just in general. A good rule to follow is never take the first plant or animal you see because it might be the last one. The most you should really be taking is a picture. Um, if you see a bird, if you see bird nesting lines, oftentimes for plovers, don't go beyond those nesting lines just for the sake of a photo. Um, you can take a nice good photo from the edge of that designated line, but going inside could actually harm those nesting birds that we're trying to, you know, we're counting them as our biodiversity. We wanna protect them, not harm them, um, just because we want <laughs> to get a nice score on our bio blitz. Um, Again, if you're in a nice forested area, or I guess even on the, the beach too, if you roll over a log to look for some sort of organism, maybe you're looking for snakes, amphibians, insects, be sure to roll it back over when you're done because that's their home. Think of it as when somebody leaves your door open after they come into your room and then leave. It's annoying for us, but it's like harmful to lethal for them. Um, and of course, be extremely careful if you are picking up wildlife like um, fish or hermit crabs, always put them back where you found them. And then of course, have fun, enjoy being outside and learning about the world around you and be sure to share your experiences on social media and tag us, tag any of the organizations that you've heard about tonight, tag us all in them. We wanna see what you guys are finding. I will comment on all of your photos that you post and say, cool or wow, um, if, they, if you're public. <laughs> um, you can interact with other people's iNaturalist posts as well. 
Um, if you know how to identify a plant, I know we have some experts in the chat tonight, um, you can help to identify a plant or animal and you can agree or disagree with their identification. Um, you can also leave a comment asking more about it or simply complimenting on their find. You can say, nice, cool. Um, you can also follow the BioBlitz journal post on iNaturalists, um, as well as create your own iNaturalist journal to document your field experiences or other striking things that you might've noticed ecologically that don't quite fit into a singular photo. For instance, if you notice a certain species that you expected to see, or if you got the chance to watch something really cool like hermit crabs fighting for a shell, or if you just had a really fun day and wanna rave about it, throw that in there as well. Um, and I think with that, we have another poll question for you. Um, are you willing to travel a little to explore the different areas of Long Island? And I think Ariel will take it from here. Awesome, thank you so much, Abby, Bill, Haley, that was great. So yes, we have our third and last poll for tonight. Are you willing to travel a little to explore different areas of Long Island? Some of the answer options are, I prefer to stay within my neighborhood, I'll go anywhere, and I don't wanna to go too far, but I'd be willing to travel within reason, which I can identify with. And it seems like that's most of the people, all right. We're amongst friends here. <laughs> I'll give you guys a few more seconds to answer. And then I'll share these results with everyone. All right, yes, so a little over Half of the participants today said that they don't want to go too far, but they'd be willing to travel within reason, which makes sense. So whether you prefer to stay in the neighborhood um, or explore areas far from home, there are plenty of sites around Long Island where you can survey for plants and animals. To help BioBlitz participants find sites near them, we put together the Google Earth BioBlitz site map. So this map lists various types of habitats, like the ones Emily went through earlier in the presentation, and some sites even have multiple habitats within them. So to explain how to use the map and show some of the information it contains, I'm gonna to navigate to the map now uh, and highlight some sites within each estuary. And just to note, the goal of this map is to act as a helpful tool and guide. So please feel free to explore wherever you'd like. So I'm gonna switch over my screen share now. Okay, can you guys see the CTUC website okay? Yes. Awesome, thank you. So what you're gonna wanna do is go to ctuck.org, head on down to get involved, look for community science projects, and then we have the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz webpage. So if you scroll down here, there's a little about section what a BioBlitz is, the dates here. And then if you look at this bluish purple box, this is the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz site map. So this button is linked here. All you do is click and the Google Earth site map should automatically populate. All right. So in the left-hand side, you can see it has a little bit of details about the map, have some information about this training webinar tonight and then a map key here. So the Long Island Sound study sites are in this blue here. We have the Peconic Estuary Partnership sites in orange. And then on the South Shore and the South Shore Estuary Reserve sites, we have them marked as yellow. So I'm just gonna go through maybe one of each and show you how to use the map. So you can just zoom in. Let's say we go to Sunken Meadow. So this is Sunken Meadow State Park. And as you can see, this little pop-up comes up, it says Sunken Meadow State Park, and it's a Long Island Sound salt marsh, beaches and dune, and coastal forest habitat. And then it says, click address below for directions. So now whether you are on your computer or your phone, this is hyperlinked. So as soon as you click it, 
it will take automatically take you to your directions and you would just choose your starting point. And this is included in each pop up box. So if we want to zoom out, maybe head on down to the Peconic Estuary. Let's head to do Northwest Harbor County Park. So it's a Peconic Estuary Partnership Beach. And again, if you click that address below for directions, that'll automatically pop up in a different browser on your phone using Google Maps. And then we also have some supplemental information here for certain sites. So whether or not pets are allowed, if there's a fee, um, if there's a visitor center that you can, you can go check out, all of that information will be here. And then let's head on down to a South Shore Estuary site. Let's go to the South Shore Nature Center. So again, South Shore Estuary Reserve, salt marsh, freshwater, wetland, coastal forest habitats have that address below, um, the website for more information. And then as you can see in this one, the Wildlife Learning Center is open on weekends from one to four. All right. And if we go back to CTUC's website, we also have a brochure, a printable downloadable brochure that you can use as well. And it's on the same web page as the site map. So you head on down to get involved. Long Island Coastal BioBlitz. See the site map is there. Great little countdown here about our webinar tonight. And then we have a resources section. So this is where the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz brochure is. It has a QR code to the iNaturalist project page, has all the important dates, goes through again what a BioBlitz is, what the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz is, all those habitats we talked about earlier, some species you might find within those habitats. And then all of the map sites are actually listed here as well with a site key. So for the first one, you'll see Akabonic Harbor SM that stands for salt marsh and that site key is right here. In addition to all the sites and species, we have those tips, tricks and best practices as well. So pack the essentials, keep an eye on your surroundings and of course have fun. So when you visit the website, um, all the resources after this webinar will be here. So that recording will be here um, and you can come back here, click either of these images and you can actually then download and print it out if you'd like. So I'm gonna switch my screen sharing again. All right. So like I said, you can just visit ctuck.org to visit and check out those, those resources that we talked about. And then some other BioBlitz logistics are again, the BioBlitz will be held from Saturday, June 26th to Saturday, July 3rd. We are also going to have a Westbrook frag fight. So we learned that frag is invasive. So we're gonna try to remove some frag from Westbrook. Um, so there'll be more information about that later on. Um, so we'll keep you posted about that. Prizes will be awarded to some of the top observers, which is really exciting, um, but you must be part of the BioBlitz project. So what we talked about earlier about joining the project, make sure you join the project um, because that's the only way that we'll be able to automatically see all of those survey submissions. Um, again, the webinar recording and all BioBlitz resources will be available at CTUC, and we will have a Long Island Coastal BioBlitz Facebook event page, so you can stay connected with other participants, 
uh, share some of your photos, share some experiences, maybe some parking tips that you think would be useful for other people. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. And then last, if you're interested in other community science events and opportunities on Long Island, SeaTuck and Peconic Estuary Partnership recently launched the Wildlife Monitoring Network website. So the Wildlife Monitoring Network acts as a one-stop shop for community science opportunities near you. So I really encourage you all to check it out and explore all the really cool projects going on around Long Island. And there's that uh, website address there. So that marks the end of our training presentation. If you have any questions about the BioBlitz, you can reach out to Emily Hall. Her contact information is there, but I will be inputting all of our contact info, um, links and things like that. And you'll also be receiving a follow-up email. So with that, we can open the webinar up for the Q&A. Ariel, mm -hmm. there was a question about finding the project on the phone. I can show that real quickly if I have a minute. Yeah, I'll stop yeah. sharing my screen now. That'd be great, Bill. I was actually, that was one of the questions I was gonna lead with. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. Where's the, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Hang on one sec. I closed iNaturalist accidentally, but here it is. This is what you see when you first go onto the app. Up on the top left, there's those three lines. Those are your menu items. You can explore other people's observations, edit your profile, change your settings, things like that. But if you pick, so I'm on the top left, if you pick projects, select that. This shows the projects you've joined. This shows projects that are nearby. That's going real slow, so we're going to skip that one. But let's say I haven't joined the Coastal BioBlitz yet. I would go to the top right and I would search LI Coastal. BioBlitz and your choices will come up to the different choices we have. So just pick that one and hit join. See the join right there. So just to review that, you're on the main screen, go to the menu on the top left, those little lines, three little lines. Some people say it looks like a hamburger, doesn't to me, but select projects and search for LI Coastal BioBlitz and then join. Is that good? Hope that helps. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bill. Okay, great. Um, so we can start off with a few questions. First, I see that we've gotten a series of questions about kind of where the BioBlitz takes place. And although we offered kind of a series of different sites where you can see different habitats, you are able and encouraged to BioBlitz and observe from anywhere on the island. So please feel free, your front yard, backyard, as I was saying with some of those coastal grassland species, you may even see them around your neighborhood. So again, we encourage you to really participate in this BioBlitz from anywhere on Long Island, um, but we just kind of provided some of the sites to guide folks or if they wanted to try someplace new. All right, I think one of the other things maybe, I don't know um, if the Lisma folks wanna get into a little bit, but I saw we had several questions about it. In terms of kind of setting different settings for your observations in terms of where they're located or if people can see they're, they're located um, in terms of geotagging for privacy concerns or whether there's a rare species kind of out there and you want, don't want people to necessarily know what it is. Um, can you guys go over a little bit of, some of the options to do that and maybe when it's best to um, hide the location versus not? I can do that. There are okay. three choices. When, when you make an observation on your phone, you can select, there's a, uh, a menu that says location visibility. 
So you have your cell phone there about to, when you're taking a picture of a uh, planter animal, you select location visibility, you'll see it listed right there. You can select, you can just leave it the way it is on the default, which is open, or you can select obscured or private for location. Generally, I keep it on open if I'm out in a park or around and just looking at typical plants and animals. If you don't want your location known, then select obscured. That's the best choice. So if you're in your backyard, if you're at home and you don't want to reveal where your house is, or if you know you're looking at an endangered or rare species that won't happen very often, you can select obscured. So that's it. Check for location visibility. Usually you don't have to do anything, but if you want, you can set it to obscured for location. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. I think um, one of the other questions I saw that we got had been answered yet. Um, and this kind of, I think, goes with some of the other questions about kind of photographing anything. So any types of invertebrates or fish or other species is that if um, they find a dead animal, photograph and submit it. That was the question. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I would say definitely anything that you see, definitely photograph it. Um, also, we should talk to you a little bit about like other wildlife safety. If you do see any type of dead animal, I would definitely keep like a respectful diff diff um, distance from that animal and try and do not handle it, especially if you don't like, have any protection on your hands or anything. So definitely don't handle the dead animal. If you see something that's like a large dead animal, like, um, you know, whether it's a seal or sea turtle or perhaps a bat or something else like that. Um, there are some other resources um, that you can contact um, at New York State DEC, or you can even reach out to me and I can put, um, put you in touch with the right people that can look into those um, findings. All right, let's see if we had another question. I think that gets at most of the questions. Oh, okay, that's a great point too from Steve Young in our chat. Try not to chase reptiles and uh, amphibians or mammals to photograph. <laughs> that is definitely true. Um, yeah, I mean, pretty much just kind of go out there, take pictures of what you see. Like I said, keep a respectful distance. And as Haley was mentioning, if you kind of move some different um, logs or sticks or wood around, just try to put things back the way you found them. All right, and we have a raised hand. I think so from Anita. All right. Anita, if you wanted to type your question into chat or into the Q&A box. Oh, hit it in error. OK. <laughs> no problem. All right. There was a, another question that I can show, which was, can't find how to take pictures. I can show sure, that. Sure, yeah, quick. please do. Yes. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so this is the phone app again. At the top here, you see a number with observations, a number in the middle with species, and then another one with identifications in it. I was reminded that an iPhone might look different. This is a, an Android, but it should be similar. To take a picture, you can't do it from this screen. The species one, go over to the left and go to observations, select observations, and then you'll get the circle with the plus sign on it to take a picture. So make sure you're over here on observations, hit that little circle and take a photo. On an okay. iPhone, it'll look more like this where you'll just see that little camera icon where it says observe, and that's how you'll take a photo. And I, we should mention too that once you join the BioBlitz, um, any of your observations from that week will go directly to the project. You can always double check on your observation that you're making, like any individual observation, you can double check to see that you are part of the project, but 
all of them should go to the project. If you're having any issues with that, again, you can reach out to any one of us, or especially so, Emily. Haley, can you, Haley, can you repeat the iPhone one? If, when you're on the iPhone, it'll just be a little camera um, logo. It's, there's a camera, if I open my phone, um, there's, you see there's the little compass, it says explore, you see activity and then observe in the middle is where you see, uh, where you can click on and take a photo. Um, yeah. All right. I'll be Thank showing you. you if you guys can see Abby's screen. Abby, say something so that you're- uh, Yeah, it was trying to get the, the, to see the phone, but there's a little camera icon right at the bottom in the middle. So you'd hit observe. And then um, as Steve Young also just pointed out uh, that you could um, take a picture or you can upload a picture that you've already taken maybe earlier in the week. Um, or, you know, maybe you don't have very good service in the field. Oh, it's not even, a, yeah, the, the white balance is not great, but um, you have some options. So it doesn't need to be right in the moment. You could take a picture and um, yeah, and then upload. If you hear something really cool too, like a really cool bird, you can get a really you could try to get a good recording of that bird and um people can identify that as well i think i naturally i've never actually done it myself but i think i naturally should be able to identify it as well so yeah birds are you might not see them but you can hear them and i can share my iphone for iNaturalist if we think that would be helpful that would be good yeah do that quick to just see another um another screen quick for the and iphone we'll include that next time We'll have both kinds next time. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's see. Can you see my phone okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm gonna go to iNaturalist here. Sure. Some observations that I had made. To search for projects, I went to the more, the three buttons on the bottom right corner. I went to projects nearby featured or I can search actually with that magnifying glass L I coastal bio blitz okay so it's actually that second one there so I go ahead and click that and now I'm going to hit join in the top left corner I don't know why it's taking so long to join. Hmm. Oh, okay, there we go. So now I'm joined because it says I can now leave. And to take an observation, I would just go to observe. I can use the camera to take a live photo so now you can just see my keyboard. You can use the camera roll button and pick from your saved photos on your phone, or you can hit record sound. All right, so that's, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I was just gonna say that that's another good feature. If, unless you, you turn off the geolocation, if you have it on, you can you can be offline and just take pictures while you're there, and then when you're back home, you can upload them all into iNaturalist and do that um, ID kind of process from the couch if you'd like. Mm -hmm. So I hope that was. Helpful. Or even from your computer, you can um, if you prefer to do it from your computer and you have some pictures on your phone, you could do you could upload new observations from your computer too. Yeah, that's a good point. You can just go out and take pictures on your phone and then put them on a naturalist later on. And yes, we actually got some questions about that. I remembered earlier on about submitting um, old photos uh, to the BioBlitz. And since we're kind of looking at a designated time period, we like to kind of keep all observations within that time period just to give us a snapshot. However, you can definitely still up those, uh, upload those photos to iNaturalist. You can do it now or before the BioBlitz starts, um, just so you can get those observations into iNaturalist and into the system. Um, so yeah, definitely take some time and do that. Maybe you can even kind of practice with iNaturalist a bit before the BioBlitz starts. Um, and then also, I just wanted to point out too, we got a little uh, 
little note about someone observing a lot of dead fish and um, Elizabeth from Peconic Asteroid Partner Partnership made a great note that if you're seeing those, they could be likely Atlantic bunker. Um, so they unfortunately had a large die off this year and you might still be seeing dead fish. So she's uh, put a great link in the chat on who to contact um, for that. So there is a specific resource to contact about those sightings as well. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions, but do any of the panelists have anything else they want to add about uh, just other helpful tips and tricks, anything else about sites within their kind of program area, any other resources maybe to look out for? Have fun. <laughs> and go in pairs. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, that's good. Yes, yeah, safety always first. <laughs> um, do you want photos like feathers? Yeah, I mean, like um, like I was saying before, any photos can be helpful. So um, definitely take photos of kind of everything you see out in the environment. Um, have fun, be safe out there, and um, be respectful of the place that you're in. But most of all, just explore all the cool habitats and species that Long Island has to offer. And like we said, uh, we'll be following up this webinar with all the different resources we provided with you tonight. The webinar will, uh, recording will be available on the CTUC website after um, tonight. Um, and you can also join the Facebook page to kind of follow along with us and others as we kind of go out and find cool species for the BioBlitz. Um, and then if you have any questions, like Ariel was saying, you can contact any one of us. Um, my contact information is there as well, and I can kind of put you in touch with um, anyone else if, we, um, if you have any other questions or any, find any other type of interesting um, species. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. We're really excited to get this BioBlitz going. We're really excited to see what you find. So hope you all have a great night. And um, yeah, we'll see you on Saturday. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.